Hello and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is William J. Magnuson, Associate Professor of Law at Texas A&M University School of Law. We will discuss his book, Blockchain Democracy, Technology, Law, and the Rule of the Crowd, which is published by Cambridge University Press. So welcome to the show, Billy. Thanks so much, Brian. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to this. As I was saying to you earlier, I've been hearing about blockchain and Bitcoin and all of these other virtual currencies and so on for a long time. And I will confess that I honestly was totally confused and had no idea what they really were or the first clue about how how they worked. And I feel like after reading your book, I kind of sort of think that maybe I'm starting to understand at least a little bit what's going on. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Brian. Yes, it is a, they are, they are very difficult to understand these technologies. And I have an entire chapter devoted just to trying to explain how exactly they work. So I hope, I'm glad that it was at least partially effective in teaching you how, how, how they work. Well, so for listeners who might be in the same boat as me, I wonder if we could kind of start there. I mean, what exactly is blockchain? How does it work? And sort of what's it for? Sure. Yeah. So Bitcoin is a kind of virtual currency uh, that is a decentralized money system. So the idea behind Bitcoin and blockchain, so blockchain is the underlying technology that makes Bitcoin work. It also happens to be an underlying technology that's quite flexible and can be used for other types of virtual currencies and even things that are not virtual currencies like smart contracts and systems. Um, so uh, Bitcoin was created back in 2009 by a uh, shadowy figure who we still have not identified named Satoshi Nakamoto. And the idea behind it was that uh, all users who bought the currency would be able to participate in maintaining a secure record of the currency itself. And so the idea was to, in a sense, revolutionize our financial system. We're going to have a system in which uh, financial institutions, the government, uh, banks, credit cards are unnecessary and, in fact, are not allowed to participate in the system uh, unless they become users. And so uh, Satoshi Nakamoto and his original writings was saying, well, this is going to be this peer-to-peer -peer system that will be entirely on the Internet. It will be run by its users. It will be run for its users. Uh, and it will create this new kind of virtual utopia that will allow um, tremendous freedom on the Internet. So that's the basic idea behind Bitcoin and blockchain. So more specifically, you know, when I talk about it, when we talk about a blockchain or about blockchain technology, like what does that mean? Like what, what's happening when something uses a blockchain and what would be the reason that a blockchain might be beneficial or useful or a technology that people would want to adopt for different purposes? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So uh, a blockchain is an effect, although there are a good number of varieties uh, of blockchain, but the basic system is a public ledger that is available and viewable by all. So anyone who wanted to could go on to the system, uh, download a copy of all the previous uh, entries into the blockchain and be able to see everything that had happened on the currency before. Uh, and so the, the reason why you would want to do that is that you want to make sure that this system, right, that's supposed to be a secure and stable virtual currency that allows people to buy things and hopefully not steal them, um, will be secure and reliable. And so one of the problems try of trying to address a system that is, in effect, decentralized and also making it stable is that you have to find a way to um, ensure that everyone can check to make sure that people aren't stealing money from them. And so the blockchain is a way to do that. Everyone can go on, download a copy of the blockchain and see where transactions have gone in the past. What this means, one of the uh, sort of amazing features of it, is that you can go back and see where each Bitcoin was created in the past and then check every place it has gone to ever since. And so you can actually go and look at the first, what's called the Genesis block, where Bitcoin was first uh, issued, and then see where it's gone over time. Uh, in addition, uh, the, the, one of the mechanisms for maintaining the system is this process called mining. So this is the, these are the sort of the giants in the industry. Um, the, the only way that you can make sure that the blockchain has not been changed or uh, tampered with is that you have a variety of miners that can be located anywhere around the world who are basically solving very difficult math problems. And these very difficult math problems ensure that people are actually doing work, it's called proof of work system, um, before they can uh, add additional blocks onto the system. And they are rewarded for this, uh, in effect, maintenance of the, of the system by getting new block issuances, by block rewards 
So in effect, uh, these miners are maintaining the system, making sure that it works and it's reliable, and they are being paid for their work in the form of new Bitcoin or whatever virtual currency it is that they're mining. So that's the, 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 the basics of the, of the blockchain system. So I was a little confused by one thing that maybe you can clarify for me. So, so the way I understand it is that there's sort of a hard limit on the amount of Bitcoin that will ever exist, like 21 million Bitcoin or something like this. And that presumably, you know, as the value of the Bitcoin increases, you just transact in smaller and smaller fractions of a Bitcoin if you want like a dollar equivalent. Or something. But if the miners are doing the work of maintaining the system, what happens when that limit is reached? Is there still a need for people to maintain it or is it self maintaining or does maintenance of the system happen in a different way? Sure. Yeah. So, exactly. The, uh, there is, in Satoshi Nakamoto, hard coded this limit into the system. So, Satoshi Nakamoto, when he first created the Bitcoin software, said, well, by the end of once we have issued 21 million Bitcoin, no more Bitcoin will be issued ever again. So that is a hard cap on it. And one of the reasons for doing that was to make sure that we couldn't inflate away value, right? One of the worries that Satoshi and many of the other sort of original programmers had was that in the real world, of course, com uh, governments could come in and issue as many new currency as they want. You can print new dollars, you can print new euros. Uh, and they wanted to make sure that we could avoid that system and actually have a hard limit, a hard cap on the total amount of Bitcoin that could ever be issued. That was the idea behind it. Uh, and so the question then becomes, well, if currently the system is maintained by these miners who are rewarded for their work with new Bitcoin, what's going to happen when you hit 21 million new Bitcoin and now there's no more to be issued? And so the answer is, and we don't know because we haven't hit that limit, it's going to be many years in the future. Uh, but the, uh, the belief is that it will soon be shifting from a sort of mining block reward system to a transaction fee system. So when you do a, a transaction, let's say I wanted to send you some Bitcoin, I could include in that transaction list, I'm sending out to the system around the world, I'm saying I'm going to send to Brian Fry, you know, a thousand Bitcoin, which would be a lot of money, by the way, because they're about, it's about $10,000 per Bitcoin today. So I don't have that many yet. Uh, but if I wanted to do it, uh, I would, I could send it out to you. And let's say I couldn't uh, incentivize them with my block reward, I could instead insert into my transaction a fee and say, I would also like to pay a couple Bitcoin to whichever miner decides to add me onto their block. And so you will eventually, it was believed, switch from a system that is about miners creating blocks in return for block rewards, and instead you will pay them a transaction fee every time that you do a transaction. Just to put that into um, sort of um, concrete terms, uh, and, and this actually occurs today. So uh, a couple weeks, actually, uh, a couple years ago, when I was first uh, researching the book, I decided I wanted to buy a cup of coffee using Bitcoin. And so I, uh, I went out and I tried to figure out how to do it. So the first question, of course, is how do you uh, find a coffee shop that actually accepts Bitcoin? And it turns out that's not so easy to do. They do have these websites that are devoted to saying where you can identifying locations that accept Bitcoin. Uh, but it turns out they're not particularly reliable. And when I went to them, the first, I think maybe five or six restaurants that I actually called that it, the website said accepted Bitcoin, called them up and they said, no, I've never heard of it. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and so then but finally, I did manage to find one. Uh, it was a Vietnamese uh, shop down near the grocery store. And I went in and I went and I spoke to the manager and he said that he didn't actually accept Bitcoin, but his payment processor did. And so if I ordered through the website, I could pay using Bitcoin on the checkout screen. So I've, now I know where I can buy a cup of coffee. And the next question is, well, how do I actually get the Bitcoin so I can spend it? So there, you have to use a, a cryptocurrency exchange. So I went to one of the biggest cryptocurrency exchanges and I bought some Bitcoin. But it turns out that actually buying cryptocurrency is not the same thing as using it to pay for things. And so in addition to using my cryptocurrency exchange, I also had to go out and get a wallet. So I went and I found another wallet company and I set that up. And I had to buy from the cryptocurrency exchange and then send the Bitcoin to this other wallet provider. I should note at the outset, these apps are relatively user unfriendly, right? They tell you that if you forget your password, there's no way to recover it, your Bitcoin's gone. Uh, it takes about two weeks to set up your account and actually have money in it. 
Uh, and every step of the way, there are fees, right? So every time that you buy, you sell, you transfer, you're paying fees to either one of the intermediaries or sometimes to the miners. Uh, but eventually, I actually got the Bitcoin. I bought it from the cryptocurrency exchange. I sent it to my wallet. I had it ready. I ordered uh, my coffee from the Vietnamese a coffee restaurant. Uh, and, uh, and I went and I picked it up a couple hours later. It was delicious. Uh, the total amount that I paid for this Vietnamese coffee was $9.32. And I could have bought it at the counter immediately with a credit card for $5 and gotten maybe cash back for my credit card. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of how clunky the system is currently uh, and also where all those fees are going to. Mm -hmm. Well, so what is a Bitcoin exchange or a wallet then? Are they like a bank kind of or something else? And Sort of what role do they play in the sort of Bitcoin blockchain virtual currency ecosystem? Sure. So they are, I would say that there are two major players within the cryptocurrency world. One is the miners that we already talked about. These are the people who are solving the difficult math equations with giant computers uh, and in return are getting paid for maintaining the system with new block rewards. Uh, in the in addition to them, there are the cryptocurrency exchanges. So these are the people that you actually go to and you buy Bitcoin from. Um, they set up markets where you can buy and sell Bitcoin um, on the platform. Um, they also can store your Bitcoin for you because one of the problems with the, um, with the blockchain system is that it is relatively inflexible, right? So everybody is identified on a blockchain through, a, through their address. And the address doesn't actually include your name. It's just a long uh, a set of numbers and letters. So it's unidentifiable. At least, at least it, you can't tell from looking at the address who you are. And so in order for the system to make sure that you aren't spending somebody else's coins or stealing somebody else's coins, you have a password, um, a private key. And you have to use that private key anytime you want to buy and sell your Bitcoin or send it to somebody. Um, but of course, the problem here is that the same problem that we all face in our day-to-day -day lives, which is that we sometimes forget our passwords, right? And so this happens in real life as well. There was a, a famous case of a, um, someone in, I think it was Wales, who uh, accidentally trashed his laptop that contained all of his private keys. And then it turned out that those private keys uh, were um, needed in order to access, I think he had several million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, and it was all accessible only through this private key. And he had thrown it out. So he was thinking about going to the... Um, uh, the the uh, the garbage collection device and and talk to the garbage collection guys and see if he could go through and troll through the um, uh, through the through the garbage platforms and he wasn't actually able to do it he never did find it so the problem with it is that if you lose your password you can never get it back and so Bitcrypt Bitcoin cryptocurrency exchanges uh, help solve this problem because they say buy and sell from us we'll store all your information with us and we'll be able to make it more uh, safer and more accessible to the regular person. Um, but they also introduce um, a degree of centralization into the system. And that's a big part of the book is exploring just how this decentralized system works and what the sort of the flaws and the benefits of it are. Um, but cryptocurrency exchanges are one place where uh, there's a high level of centralization. There's a few cryptocurrency exchanges uh, that contain the majority of uh, cryptocurrency. And so if you want to, uh, if you're a government seeking to gain insight into what's happening on a cryptocurrency, um, the cryptocurrency exchanges are a good way to do that. And also, if you are a hacker uh, and you want to get access to some cryptocurrency and steal it, the cryptocurrency exchanges are a great place to hack. Um, it turns out they, there are a number of well-known hacks that have stolen billions of dollars from, from users. So that's the basic idea behind a cryptocurrency exchange. Yeah. Well, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this concept of centralization versus dispersal of information regulation. I mean, like when Bitcoin and the concept of the blockchain were initially created, like what was the context in which that happened? And, you know, sort of what was, what sort of social milieu, as it were, I guess, was prompting people to see this as something interesting and and valuable? And what do you think kind of caused it to really take off in the, I mean, honestly, kind of unexpectedly like rapid way that it has. Sure. Yeah. So I think that the um, the initial ideas that led to the creation of Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrencies 
um, really date back to the early 1990s. Right? So this is a period when the internet was just developing. You know, there were uh, web crawlers like Netscape that were just becoming, just being launched. Um, and so uh, a group of computer science um, aficionados uh, started thinking about, well, what, what, are the, what are the issues that are going to be raised by this new world of cyberspace? Um, and there was a particular group that became known as the cypherpunks that, uh, that became a really vibrant community discussing what would happen when the internet was everywhere. Um, and so one of their primary concerns was, well, the internet's going to open up all these new frontiers for knowledge and communication, um, but it also opens up, opens up new frontiers for government surveillance, right? Now, all of a sudden, the government can go and take a look. If they can get access to your internet records, they can take a look at all of these things that are happening in your life. And so the cypherpunks were deeply worried about what the internet would do to people's private lives. And the answer to this for them was cryptography, right? The idea of codes and, in, and introducing um, uh, privacy back onto the internet. And they eventually laid this groundwork for what would eventually become the blockchain. There's a great document um, that was written by one of the founders of the cypherpunks called the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. And it quite, uh, it quite clearly makes reference to the Communist Manifesto. It begins with something like a specter is haunting the modern world, a specter of crypto anarchy. Uh, and then it goes into all of these new issues that are going to be raised about the lack of privacy, about uh, social disintegration, about uh, drug dealers and tax evaders going onto the internet. And I think the cypherpunks were really ahead of their time in that, and that they, um, they worried about these data privacy issues that today have only become more, more pressing. So that was the sort of the social milieu in which it all developed. Well, so, I mean, in relation to that, like, what would make using Bitcoin or other kinds of cryptocurrency attractive to someone? I mean, like, you know, I use a regular bank, I have an ATM card, you know, a credit card, it all works pretty seamlessly. Like, what about, about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and someone would make that attractive to me and make it something I would want to use in in the alternative to just using a traditional bank and sort of like who's using this material and what are they using it for? Sure. Um, so I think there's one, there, in my mind, there's really only one reason why you would want to use a blockchain and that is you distrust the central authority. Like the only reason why you would want to go into this system um, is that you believe that the current people who run it, right, the financial institutions, the government, uh, you distrust them. You think that they are not engaging in good behavior. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why you might not trust them. Um, so right, I, I might not be worried about somebody um, snooping on my buying a Vietnamese coffee last week, um, but I might be more worried, right, if I were going out and I were buying drugs, right? So that's one uh, mechanism, right? If I'm doing illegal things, then maybe cryptocurrencies are attractive. Um, but maybe there's other reasons why. Maybe it's um, I'm less worried about um, about what happened when I bought that that uh, that Vietnamese coffee. But maybe I'm more worried about just my privacy. I don't want people seeing what I buy at all, or I don't want seeing I don't want people seeing who who the people are that I'm sending my money to. And so if it's really uh, you may be driven to a Bitcoin or a blockchain or another virtual currency just because you believe deeply in the importance of privacy and you think the government and the financial system is not doing a good job. Of protecting that privacy. Um, there are other things that actually you can do using a blockchain that, say, typical currencies can't do. So there are these systems, these smart contracts that have gotten a lot of uh, play in recent years that allow people to, in effect, in, encode a contract that would be, that would be self-executing. So basically, I could enter into a contract with you that would say, you know, if you interview me, I will send you Bitcoin. That's that's not the <laughs> that's not the arrangement we're under currently. But uh, I could enter into an arrangement like that, and maybe if you uploaded uh, the inter the the interview onto the internet, then uh, the code would automatically send you some Bitcoin. So that might right be 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 something that you could encode into in the blockchain that you couldn't normally do uh, with a with a dollar. Right, that's just not built into the dollar system. Um, so there's a few other sort of niche uses, and those are being explored. In a number of industries, so for example, um, in the financial sector, people are really interested in uh, how blockchain might be able to improve sort of the plumbing of the system to be able to uh, clear and settle 
um, derivatives and other financial transactions. So that's one where there's lots of counterparties that have to all agree on what has happened. Um, and so blockchain might solve that problem. Uh, another uh, big, uh, big sector that's had interest in it is the shipping industry, where you have all these players who all have to interact with each other, right? The people who uh, load up the, 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 the packages, put them onto the ship, uh, the, 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 the people who accept the customs, the people who um, then ship them over, and the people who accept the boat when they arrive. Um, so at each one of these stages, you have to have somebody provide some documentation and ensure that it's all going through safely. And so the shipping industry believes, or in particular, Maersk has invested in a big system, big blockchain system, that would allow people to use a blockchain to track their shipping. So those are a couple of the industries that have shown interest in, in using blockchain in the actual business. Mm. Well, so, I mean, it seems like one of the big advantages then is this sort of like, it's almost like a decentralized autonomous system that maintains kind of accuracy and consistency without requiring any kind of centralized control that we might otherwise respect, uh, expect to see in similar circumstances. But I wonder, like, to what extent does that entail giving things up? Right. I mean, it seems like one of the be potential benefits of centralized control is, you know, the ability to regulate, the ability to fix problems, the ability to prevent people from engaging in fraud or other kinds of criminal activities for, for better or or for worse. I mean, what do you see the trade offs as being when it comes to blockchain and virtual currency? Yeah, so I think it, there are some major trade offs. Uh, one of which, of course, is this idea that um, a lot of cryptocurrencies have been used for illegal uses, or at least even if not a large percentage of them are used in illegal uses, the sort of the dark web, dark net world of the internet has embraced them in a way that has been very bad, both for the reputation and for the regulation of the industry. Right? It turns out there was just an article that came out a couple weeks ago that said that um, dark net markets had accepted around $800 million worth of cryptocurrencies in the last year. So $800 million of cryptocurrency are being pumped into these dark net markets, right? These are drugs, guns, assassination markets, um, all sorts of bad things. Um, the FBI is starting to take notice. They've said they're going to surge their resources devoted to tackling this dark net problem, right? So that's one of the costs, right? This idea that the, the underworld is, is uh, deeply attracted to cryptocurrencies. The other one, which is maybe less obvious, but has become a big problem in the, in the industry, is just the lack of efficiency of the system. So we talked uh, earlier about how these miners are solving difficult math problems in order to maintain the system. Well, it turns out solving these difficult math problems, it's really hard, and it requires lots of computing power, and that means lots of energy. And so these studies have come out showing just how much energy they are using. Uh, there was a study a few years ago that said that uh, cryptocurrencies were uh, consuming the amount of energy that the entire country of Iceland consumes in a year. Right? So this, these are uh, deeply inefficient systems from the perspective of how many transactions they're handling. And so that's another big cost. Um, and then finally, I think there's another cost, which is not so much directly related to uh, blockchain, but the fact that it's so new and it's so different is that it just doesn't fit very neatly within our regulatory systems. And so we don't really know exactly where, uh, what it is, right? Is it a, is it a, uh, a currency? Is it a security? Is it a commodity? And the legal system works by categorizing things, right? We have to know, okay, well, if it's security, we're going to um, have the securities regulations come into play. If it's money, then we're going to have money transmitter laws come into play. If it's a commodity, then the Commodities a Futures Trading Commission will, um, will, will tackle it. And so if we don't know where it is, then in a sense, nobody's regulating it or everybody's regulating it. And in either case, it's not good for the industry and it's not good for society. So, so I think that's another one of the costs, which is that we don't know where it fits. And because it doesn't fit anywhere, uh, it either completely gets under-regulated under or in some cases it gets over-regulated depending on the sort of the status in the country. Mm. Well, I wonder if you talk a little bit more about that because, you know, honestly, the, from the first time that I heard, about cryptocurrencies, the former securities lawyer and me 
was thinking, how can it be that this isn't a security, right? I mean, the test for securities is really broad. It seems like in a lot of ways, the kind of the, the kind of typical Howey test is more or less satisfied when it comes to thinking about how at least most of these cryptocurrencies work. And to the extent that people are trying to avoid the Howey test by like kind of creatively structuring, I mean, like that's not the kind of thing we want to let people avoid securities regulation by doing that. I mean, you know, the the reach of the SEC is broad. Why isn't the SEC or why can't the SEC be regulating these kinds of activities? And are there kind of practical limits or on the ability of the SEC to do anything here? Yeah. So this has been one of the big focuses within, within the industry is do securities regulations uh, govern <clears throat> cryptocurrencies? And the answer is some of them, yes. Some of them know, and some of them maybe at the beginning, but not at the end. Uh, so, so it's this really weird mishmash. It all comes down to um, uh, something that you mentioned is called the Howey test, which was this um, uh, this case from the Supreme Court, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, that said that a security or an investment contract uh, is regulated by the securities regulations if a person is investing their money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profits from the efforts of others. So if you look at every one of those factors, it just, it both is and is not a con an investment contract, right? So is it an investment of money? Well, it's probably an investment of money, but maybe not if it's an investment of cryptocurrency in a cryptocurrency. Is it a common enterprise? Well, yes, it's certainly a common enterprise in the sense that Bitcoin is run by everybody, but it's not a common enterprise in the sense that it's a corporation. It doesn't seem like a corporation in the way that we typically think of when we think of a, uh, of a security, a share of a company. Uh, and then... Is it profit solely from the efforts of, of others? Well, it does require the efforts of others to maintain it, but you are also participating in it. Um, and then finally, are you getting into it for profits or are you getting in it for other reasons? And so um, some people are getting into it because they're hoping that in a year, Bitcoin will be worth twice as much as it is today or 10 times as much. But other people are getting into it because they just want a stable a uh, place to park their money. And maybe if they're in a country where currencies fluctuate a lot and they think that Bitcoin is going to be a better way to do it. And so uh, it does, I think, present a difficult question. Now, the SEC has come out um, uh, over the last few years and it's provided greater guidance. And they said Bitcoin is not a cryptocurrency. Uh, and they've also given guidance on others. One of the fascinating parts of the industry is there one of the big cryptocurrency exchanges here uh, is a company called Coinbase. And they've invented this system. And they, and they obviously, they are uh, buying and selling cryptocurrencies for other people. And so it's deeply important to them to know whether something is a security, because if it is, then they may be facing regulation and they need to make sure that they're complying with the securities regulations. And so they've actually created the system where anytime somebody launches a new, if it's sufficiently big, anytime somebody launches a new cryptocurrency, they will actually give it a sort of Howey test scale. They'll say, okay, this is a one, it's definitely not a security. You know, five, it definitely is a security. And then there's all these things in between. Maybe it's a three, so it's halfway in between a security. We think it's, you know, a 30% chance that, a 50% chance that the SEC will find it to be a security. But I think that gives you just a, a, an insight into just how uncertain everything is within the cryptocurrency world. Mm. Well, so we primarily think of these, you know, blockchain and so on in relation to cryptocurrencies and sort of money substitutes. But you mentioned that there are some alternative uses. And in particular, in the book, you talk about potential uses in relation to kind of collective governance or or democracy. I, mean, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of ways in which these new technologies might be useful in the context of kind of shared self-governance. Sure. Yeah. And so, I mean, the title of the book is Blockchain Democracy. So, uh, and, and I think that really goes to two points. Uh, one is these systems themselves, the blockchains, uh, are in a way democratic, right? They're being run by everybody. Uh, but there's another element of it too, which is that Maybe we can use these blockchains to improve our democracy, or we need to understand how they're affecting our democracy. And it turns out that a variety of companies have tried to use the blockchain to improve our election systems. Right? So one of the basic problems right, in, in, in our electoral system, which we have now seen in Iowa and the Iowa caucuses, is that it's actually really hard to run an election in a way that we know everybody is being counted, that we know our votes are being counted, and we know they're being counted in the right way. 
Um, and so blockchain, um, in a way, provides a solution to this, right? You can have a system that's going to be public because everybody can access it, everybody can see what happened, but nobody can identify who exactly voted which way. And so there are a couple of companies, including a, um, one, uh, one company called Votes, that has, been, that has used V-O-A-T-Z, and they've tried to use their system, um, I think it was actually used in, uh, in, in West Virginia in, in elections a couple of years ago. Um, and so they tried to use their system to say, we will use blockchain. It won't be the only mechanism in the, in, the, in the election, but it will be one mechanism for ensuring that people's votes are being counted and people can check to make sure they were counted correctly. They were, their vote in favor of one candidate versus another was actually correctly recorded. Uh, and maybe they could solve this problem that is currently bedeviling our systems, right? Um, we don't know. We have a lot of worries about um, just how safe and unhackable our digital voting machines are. And so maybe the blockchains can provide a solution to that. I should say that computer science experts and election science experts are deeply worried about this as well. Um, and so most people who I have spoken to have said, no, this is not what we want to be doing right now. We do not want to be putting all of our voting onto a mobile phone that could be hacked and onto a blockchain system that could also be hacked. And so there's also a reaction to this push as well. We may not be ready for it. Mm. Well, so, I mean, Billy, in, in closing, I sort of wanted to reframe some of what you just said in light of a sort of dialectic that you pose throughout the book between centralization and dispersion of information and processing. And you sort of use Hobbes and Locke as as your metaphors. And, I mean, it seems to me that in some ways the way you describe blockchain and the way it's kind of potential is very consistent with a certain kind of dispersed vision of democracy and of legitimacy and of shared governance, but maybe in tension with alternative kind of more centralized, more sort of like consensus oriented versions of democracy or shared governance. And I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit on that relationship. I mean, what do you think the kind of the, the promises, but also the risks of blockchain technology and similar kinds of, you know, alternative ways of thinking about governance are in relation to concepts of democracy and, and shared governance? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that really, for me, blockchain, and part of the reason why I wrote this book, was that I thought it was a fascinating story about what happens when technology uh, hits the world. Right, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto and these other founders, they thought they were creating Bitcoin as a way to create a digital utopia that was going to be free from powerful institutions. Um, but the result has been basically the opposite, right? It's become a haven for drug dealers and hackers. It's dominated by a few large mining companies in China. Um, last year, $800 million of Bitcoin were stolen, right? So this is not what the founders envisioned. Uh, and so I think that uh, right, investors, entrepreneurs, businesses, governments, we need to be aware when we create things of the biases and the tendencies of the markets into which they will be introduced. And I think if we don't design them with those in mind, we're likely to get uh, sort of unexpected results. Uh, and so I think blockchain is in ways a cautionary tale, but it also shows just how um, unique and innovative um, technology can be today and how it can really make large changes very quickly and gain widespread acceptance. Um, so that's one of the, the main takeaways I have uh, from the book was just, uh, just how wonderful um, this, this hope is that we can use technology to, to, to save ourselves uh, from the sort of the corrupting influences that, uh, that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Billy. It was really uh, a fun book to read. I enjoyed talking to you about it, and I hope listeners will pick up a copy for themselves. Well, thanks so much, Brian. It was a real pleasure to speak with you. Bitcoin and things like it is the equivalent of the red pill. This is a technology, it's a computing language, and I can build an app on it. Is Bitcoin the... 
cryptocurrency of the future. Crypto gang, it's the game, big gang, all gang, light gang, cash game, blockchain. Whoa, I don't really ever buy stocks, man. No. Haters wanna say I'm in a bubble, man. No. Ch chew them up like bubble gum. No. Just made a meal with my pocket chain. No. Wreck about to go and join the huddle gang. Huddle gang, huddle gang, huddle gang. Crypto gang, it's the game, big gang, all gang, light gang, cash game, blockchain. Whoa, I don't really ever buy stocks, man. No. Haters wanna say I'm in a bubble, man. No. Ch chew them up like bubble gum. No. Just made a meal with my pocket chain. No. Wreck about to go and join the huddle gang. Huddle gang, huddle gang, huddle gang. Ethereum pays for my rent. Bitcoin pays for the vent. Litecoin pays for the jet. Bitcoin cash for the rest. Spent 30 racks on an ICO. What coin did you buy? I forgot, yo. Just got started last night, bro. And I'm already hooked like a pipe, though. Flipping the coin, making it grow, taking it slow, letting it go. Cash flow's growing, it's incredible to watch it flow. Stacking the cash, taking it home, making it fast. I'm on a roll. Little bit mo's all I ask for the bubble, though. Currently, learning about a new type of currency. Burning the dollar down like an emergency. Urgently, listen, my friends have been urging me. Coins have been surging, we're earning like surgency. We on a mission, man. Crypto mania. Act like you don't really know about it. Stop that. Bitcoin blowing up like a bomb. Step back. Used to be a couple hundred dollars. Should have caught that. Blew up on a scene from the mind of a brainiac. Back in 2009, where the miners at? Silk Bro, baby, it's gotta be anonymous. Satoshi blew up, now we on the map. You. Crypto gang, it's the game, big gang, all gang, light gang, cash game, blockchain. Whoa, I don't really ever buy stocks, man. No. Haters wanna say I'm in a bubble, man. No. Ch chew them up like bubble gum. No. Just made a meal with my pocket chain. No. Wreck about to go and join the huddle gang. Huddle gang, huddle gang, huddle gang. Everybody looking at me now and they're shocked now because the price going down. Meanwhile, I'm a cop more at a discount with a smile because I'm making money on the altcoins right now. I'm a double down like Animal Style Sup now. People in the crowd, they watching me bubble up now. Open up a brand new Coinbase account and I'm buying everything from Ripple to Litecoin now. Pull out my principle, keep it real simple, then play with the house. Investing in crypto, I'm chasing these coins like they chase to a mouse. I'm on the verge of a digital currency, merging technologies. This is the future, so obviously I'm all in. There's no bottom. We holding now. Hold gang, hold gang, hold gang, hold gang, hold gang, hold gang, hold gang. Throw your hands in the air, man. If you down with the blockchain, I ain't got time for the haters, man. We about to grow to a million. Hold gang, hold gang, hold gang. Tell me, are you down with the crypto? Hold gang, hold gang, hold gang, hold gang, hold gang, hold gang, hold gang. Throw your hands in the air, man. Down with the blockchain. I ain't got time for the haters, man. Nope. We about to grow to a million. Hold a gang, hold a gang, hold a gang. Oh. Tell me, are you down with the crypto? It is the most powerful technology that the world has seen, I believe, since the invention of agriculture. Bitcoin is exciting because it shows how cheap it can be. Bitcoin is is better than currency. As with most major technology shifts, let's think about what young people are doing. 32% of young people say they prefer Bitcoin to stocks. 42% of millennial males say they plan to purchase Bitcoin in the next five years. We're barely in the first inning right now.